Church again. Good morning, Destiny Church. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord, for He is here. He is in this place.
Lord. So we don't welcome you into the house of the Lord today. We've got much to be joyful about. We're going to talk about joy today. And, uh, I want you to make yourself at home today for a family of believers, loving God and His creation, learning to be followers of Christ through God's good word. And we're living out our divine destiny through the leading of the Holy Spirit. We are loving, we're learning, and we're living. Amen? Amen. And so today I want us to pray for several who are traveling today. I look at people when they travel and go on vacation as missionaries. You never know who might see your life. We also have some people on a mission trip today. Danny and Renee Chambliss are doing this work in Nicaragua. So we pray for them today. So let's just go to the Lord with a joyful heart today, rejoicing for what God has done in our lives this week. And also that we be mindful of Jeffrey and his family today. Jeffrey lost his father uh, earlier this week on Friday and uh, the funeral's tomorrow. So he's going to be preaching his father's funeral. That was his request of him. So let's remember them in prayer today as well. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and your grace today. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your compassion. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your sweet spirit. I thank you for your son who died on the cross. And Lord, my worst day is always better with you because you're in it. And so God, I just ask that you would comfort those who are mourning today. That you would be with those and the praises of those that are rejoicing. Life goes on in this world, we will have trouble. It's fragile and it's short. But for those of us that know you, this is just a breath. We're going to be with you forever. So God, I just ask today that you be with the hands and feet of those who are vacationing today. Let them be alive for those that are doing mission work in Nicaragua and other places today. For those that are out and about doing their business today, God, I just pray that you use them mightily. And for those today that may be tuning in, just happen to get a share on Facebook and happen to be listening in today, I pray for your presence to fill their home their bedroom, their car, wherever they may be today, God. Lord, we need you now more than ever. This world needs you. And our desire today is simply to do whatever you want to do in this service and in our lives. So as we open up our hearts today and we begin to open up our mouths and continue to praise you, God, we know that as we praise you that the throne room of heaven is ignited with excitement that you inhabit our praise and angels are circling the throne room today in excitement as your creation your beloved, your redeemed, as we pray you, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, church. Amen. Can we stand to our feet and give it praise today? Praise the Lord. Amen.
joy is really a condition more than it is a feeling. And it's really more of a state of who you are and where you're at than it is uh, even a feeling. And even the world says, I'm going to hear from you a little bit later about this, that joy is, in the world's eyes, Wikipedia says, Wikipedia, Wikipedia says, I've got a little sleep deprivation. Bear with me today. Wikipedia says that it is living the good life. We that know Jesus Christ, we know the good life. But sometimes joy is not so much what we perceive it to be happiness, but it's just what Dion was singing. We'll go back into that later today for altar, but that we set our hearts upon Jesus. But what I want you to get a hold of, what God was speaking to me as we were worshiping today, is that if you know Jesus Christ today, you've got a song in your heart. The Holy Spirit placed the song in you the day that Jesus redeemed himself. And the enemy wants to silence that song. He wants that song to be one of lamenting. I'm, I'm thinking in the Old Testament when Israel was in captivity and their captors said, sing us one of those songs that you used to sing. Even they had heard of the songs of the children of God. And they said, well, how can we sing when we're sitting here lamenting? But as we talked about just a few weeks ago, in that jail cell in the book of Acts, somewhere around midnight, one of them decided, you know what? Let's just go ahead and sing. After they prayed, let's sing. And so they're going to go back into a song I asked them to go back into this morning. And I want you to think about your song. Think about the song that God has placed in your heart. You may not feel like singing today. You may be going through some things. You may be tired. You may be weary. You may be depressed. You may be broken. You may be in struggles and strife. You may even be in the throes of addiction today. But Jesus Christ is here. He's ready to save you. He's ready to redeem you. He's ready to restore your song. So as they sing today, let it, let it ring. Let it ring. It doesn't matter whether you can sing or not. We do it loud enough to hear. They probably can't hear beside me. And if they can, it's okay. You know, Teresa asked me a couple weeks ago. She's not been beside me in a while. We were, we were at another church. And, and my praise has kind of developed over time into some weird interpretive dance sometimes. And so I get praising and I'm just feeling the song and I'm doing this. And we're, we're at this other church and she looks over at me and goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm praising the Lord. And she said, well, that's interesting. So your praise is interesting, it's unique to you. But the, the idea here, guys, is get it out. Get it out of your heart. Get it out of your lips. Get that song in your spirit and let it lift you today. Amen? Let's continue to worship. Let's go. It's your rare and our love. So we pour out the
place in my life. Just a, a battle spiritually with darkness and, and just an overwhelming oppression and some external things happening that just kind of uh, an onslaught and combination of things. And, and this is just this week, even in the midst of everything that was going on with preparation for uh, Teresa going to surgery, I, I'm singing a lot. You don't hear me sing because I cannot sing, but Teresa hears me sing a lot. And I noticed that my song had returned. For a couple of weeks there, I wasn't even singing. And, that, and I'm just putting all this together. My God wants to deal with us about this this morning. And as I began to sing again on the other side of this, whatever it was, this was the song that I was singing. So it is His breath in your lungs today. You're here because He allows it. It's by His grace. And it's by His stripes we are healed. And so I pray for your healing today, emotionally, spiritually, physically. And I pray for you to be whole and well from any of you who are struggling with sin. So on the count of three, will you entertain me with the thought that we'll just give a victory shout? We clap a lot. We'll clap after this. But there's something about just lifting our lungs and just say whatever the Lord leads us to. You don't even have to say anything. You can just talk. Oh, it's okay. But in a declaration, the Lord can say to me, we're singing that, victory's in the house, victory's in the house, victory's in the house. If you need victory today, victory is in the house. So as we count of three, let's just give us a little victory cry. Can we do that today? One, two, three. Sunday morning, our children are getting the same thing. So 
they can talk about it at lunch and keep that continuity. And that takes a lot of work on behalf of our children's pastors and workers. And so we picked this curriculum here, and I really thought, you know, number one, perception of, of how this might be perceived in the body of Christ crept in because uh, we get kind of labeled sometimes as the liberal church and, and among my peers, but, you know, I don't even know what that means, by the way. I don't care, to be honest with you, but sleep deprivation is kicked in already, so I'm just praying <laughs> today. But I have really enjoyed this. This is something that that God began to drive a single thought in my mind about. That we as human beings tend to live day to day by our feelings. How we feel. Even those of us who have been in the sweet presence of the Lord or the exciting presence of the Lord, powerful presence of the Lord, that affects our feelings. A supernatural God is going to affect the natural body. And that's a powerful thing. And it's great. And I'm not here to say that's not what we should do. And God is not here to say today that feelings are not something that He gave us because they are. They're a gift. They're a beautiful gift. No creation He created can express themselves like us as human beings, as in beloved. But also, those emotions, those things were never meant to define us or rule us or control us. And so he began to drive in me this thought that we can live beyond our emotions, that we can deal with how we feel. And so again today, as we look at joy, we're going to take that overall concept. And for those of you who may not be aware of this, if you've got any type of smartphone, you can find these icons on that smartphone. Emoji is actually a Japanese word that means face drawing or face painting. So that's where the word emoji came from. And so we've been looking at some emotions over the last few weeks with that thought in mind that we can live beyond emotions. And so the very first week we looked at happy, and happy is close to joy. I'll get into the difference of those here in just a second. We looked at cool in God's terms in Scripture. We looked at love. Uh, Jeffrey brought that word to you. And we looked at praise, the freedom of praise, the happy hands. And then last week, we looked at the good and bad of sad. So today, we're going to look at joy. And God reminded me of something I'd heard a few years ago, that joy is Jesus overflowing in you. I'm not going away with that joy. Jesus overflowing in you. I don't remember where I heard it. I would give credit to it, but it's Jesus overflowing in you. And so God began to talk to me this week as I began to prepare uh, sitting with Teresa and other places that this, we could just use these as our points today. So we'll look at Jesus, we'll look at overflowing, and how that affects us and you. Well, let me just give you some thoughts really quickly about joy. Uh, happiness, the difference between happiness and joy. Happy tends to be more of a come and go emotion. It's much more about how we feel. Where joy more defines, as I said earlier, kind of a state of being. Happy tends to be more temporary and fleeting, and joy tends to be longer in duration and creates a longer, lasting, more permanent memory in our minds. It's something we can go back to and even experience joy as we revisit it. But joy can be lost and memories can fade. And so a joke can make us happy. Uh, chocolate ice cream made me really happy at about 11.30 this morning. I let it melt, and so I just saw that as God signed to eat the whole thing. And so it made me really happy. That was fleeting after I started thinking about how many calories and I looked on the, on the thing. It didn't last long. And your team winning can bring you happiness. But we all know that that doesn't last long. Even if your team is really good, there's the chance of loss. And so let's look at joy. Birth of a child can bring joy. A wedding. Getting your first home. Those things bring us joy. We can revisit that and revisit those memories. Happiness and joy, they're linked so closely together, but they are different. And if you think about it in terms of sports, um, I was thinking about Chicago Cubs. You know, it had been 108 years since they had won the World Series. They'd gotten really close on many occasions, and that disappointment was over and over. And so while they might win, they play, the average Major League Baseball team plays 162 games a year. 162 games a year. And so while they may, may win one game in one series, that may make you happy 
or win a series that they weren't supposed to win, but winning a World Series after over 100 years of drought will bring you joy. That's something that we can all relate to in the world's terms. And so that's a natural look at joy and happiness. And so now I want to get into the spiritual part of this. So happiness really is determined by our circumstances. We talked about that before. I asked you what makes you happy, the condition of that and those things. And that's what we went in that first sermon. You can go back in the archives and find that. And look at that if you want to. But God wanted us to realize the temporariness of that, but also let us rejoice. We are to rejoice when things are happy. We love to be happy. We love to laugh. And our children are learning about that today, about how good laughter is. That laughter is good medicine, the Bible says. And they're also learning the right things to laugh at and what not to laugh at. And so we'll get into a little bit of that here in a second, but we're really going to take another, another vein with this today in that... When I began to understand that happiness is fleeting and I am to enjoy it, it doesn't define who I am. It doesn't have to define my day. It doesn't have to define my month, my year, whether I am happy or about a particular situation or I have to do something to get happiness. We'll look at counterfeits as well today. But there is an underlying joy for those of us that know Jesus Christ. There's a state of our being that we can have. And while joy is associated with laughter and elation and celebration, there is also just an underlying joy, as the Bible talks about in spiritual terms, that gives us strength. It's something that we draw from. It's something that we overwhelmingly know that in our hearts there is joy. While it may not be affected on the outside in our feelings right this moment, there is an underlying joy that God has given me in my heart and in my soul. As I said earlier, God just kind of gave us that example during praise and worship about a song. Having that song in our heart, that's really our joy. And so when I became a child of the King, I realized that on a daily basis, I could have joy. I can learn to live beyond my emotions. I can learn to deal with how I feel. So let's look at Jesus overflowing in you. And I want to do that by looking at a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed in the book of Romans. Let's, it's going to be in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And up to this time, Romans is a letter written to the Christians, the new believers in Rome. Rome is a very volatile place. Rome is persecuting Christians. Nero is doing all kinds of uh, unthinkable things to Christians. And so the first 15 chapters of this letter, and that letter did not have chapters in it, it was canonized later. But Paul is talking to them as new believers. He's filling in any holes that may be lost and how they are to live for Christ. He talks about grace. He talks about not abusing grace. He talks about the, the love of, of the Father. He talks about unity of the brethren. And so he's just doing great assurance, good discipleship, and good teaching. Then at the end of that, in verse 13, he goes to a prayer, and then the rest of the letter he's dealing with individual things. But this is an overall encompassing, encouraging letter to the church at Rome in a very difficult time. And 13 is a one-verse prayer that he prays at the end of that. So let's look at what 13 says. I'm going to read the Living Translation to you. Paul says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a great, great prayer? So let's read it again. It's, it's short today. Let's just read this again. This is Paul praying for the church of Rome that it will be me praying for you as we leave this place today. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen to the Word of God. So, I want us to look at how this prayer looks at those three points. Jesus overflowing in you. First, let's look at the source. Jesus is the source. If I'm going to be overwhelmingly filled with joy, I've got to look at the source of that joy. And so as we talked about, joy is an event that I can go back to 
and I can relate to it and experience joy again because that was such a defining moment in my life. What more of a defining moment for us that know Jesus Christ could there be than when Jesus Christ, through the blood of his sacrifice on the cross, allowed you and I to be born again, to get a second chance on life, and not only in this life, but in the life to come, to live with him forever. I don't know if you remember the joy when you encountered Christ and his love and his grace, but I remember it well, and I visit it often because I can grab a hold of how I once felt and return back to the joy and the fervor that I had before. And some of you have been living for the Lord your whole life, and so there may not have been a defining moment. You may have accepted him early if you're just uh, like Teresa, my wife, you live for him forever. But there are moments in your life that you live for him forever that you know that he fills your heart with joy. That he's given you peace in a particular situation. There's been something that you were heavy about, that you were burdened. There was something that was so great and oppressing in your life. And then you got victory as he was shouting this morning over and over in the spirit realm. As you got victory from that, your heart was filled with joy. And so that's a defining moment. That's an event. I'm, I'm trying to stir those moments and events back up in your mind today. Because that is where we would draw strength from. That is where we draw source from. And it is also where we draw faith from. Because Paul said that we must trust in him. That the God of all peace can give us a place that we can trust him. And I will share with you that I've never been placed in a position in my life where he asked me to trust him that he didn't come through. Maybe not in the time frame that I had hoped for. Maybe not even in the way that I asked him. But he's came through in every situation of my life. And so I can draw from that that there's an overall condition in my life that can happen. But God is driving a theme in us. He's driving something into us as we go into this next season because there's a lot for us to do. I am never going to be able to live my life with joy on a daily basis without going to my source on a daily basis. And I know that you get tired of me saying this, but it's so simple and so easy but so hard for us to do. To go to Jesus every day in every situation and everything that brings us grief and trouble and sorrow, we have to condition ourselves and practice our faith so that He is our first thought. That He is so much a part of us and so much in our lives that when anything comes our way, we know that He knows because He lives in us. And that source, I'm with Him every day. That source, I spend time with Him. That source, I am communing with Him. And I'm talking to the Father because I have an advocate in the Father that can help me with my source of joy in my life. And so I'm able to reach out to Him every day of my life. But as He's told me many times before in my own life, Jesus has to be number one in every corridor and every part of my life. He can't be in the top ten. He can't be in the top five. He's got to be number one. And then I'll live my life so much more without stress, without worry and strife because I won't think of Him about six things later or when I get down in the ditch, I'll think of Him when I get close to the ditch. There's a difference. There's a difference. And the Christian needs to wake up today and hear those words. The Lord's trying to wake me up today to hear those words. People who don't have God, they don't have a blessed hope. We say that all the time. We say, we say, man, I don't know what people would do without Christ. I, I don't know what they would do in this situation. And that's so true. How can they deal with those things? They, they go to counterfeits. They try to find it in a bottle. They, they try to find it uh, in, in support groups that, that recognize a higher, higher being. And they don't even know who that higher being is. So God's the source, as Paul says, of all hope. It's like having the cure for a chronic disease that's going to kill you eventually, but you're saying, I don't really need the cure. I'm just going to, I don't believe the cure will work. And so I'm just going to go on over here and I'll get the cure eventually, but I'm just going to stay sick a while. Isn't that a great analogy? Here's the cure. We're showing the cure to the world and the cure's going, the world's going, Nah, we don't want that. We like the way we are. But for those of us that know him, there's not only a cure, 
There is a way to remove the infection. There's a way to remove all the symptoms of the disease. And so if I accept Him as my Lord and Savior, I have the cure. I've accepted the cure. But if I don't get daily medicine, that infection is still going to have a hold on me. It's still going to affect me symptomatically. It's going to change my life. And the longer I stay away from my daily medicine, the more sick I become. And you can recognize that in your own life. Those times that you're away from Him, those times that you're too busy to get with Him, those times that you're too sad to reach out to Him, it's like having that daily dose and refusing to get a hold of it. We've got to go to Him and we've got to go to Him often. I remember early in my Christian walk saying, I didn't want to bother Him with this, that, and the other. I was just bothering Him with the major things. How silly am I and how narrow the thought of my God that I have. He can handle it. If everyone in this world decided to pray today at one time, he could hear every prayer. He could answer everyone just like the same moment that it was asked. That's who our God is. You're not going to burden him. He needs you to talk to him because you need to talk to him. It is our prayer today that joy would come into every heart and every soul. That this world would see the cure. That our prayer flows through that bloodline because... What I want you to see today is your trouble and your strife. You have these things that are stealing your joy and causing those things to, to come into your life. As the Holy Spirit dwells in you, as Paul said, He's living in you. And as you cry out to God, the source of all hope, and I've got to get some hope. If I don't get hope, hope deferred makes the heart sick, the Bible says. And so I've got to pray and intercede for hope. And as the Holy Spirit in me begins to stir me and encourage me and lead me to pray, I pray to God the Father through the source of all hope, but the blood of Jesus Christ, the bloodline, allows my prayer to be heard in the throne room of heaven. As I pray, He talks to His Father in a way that well, He will understand, and He hears every prayer I pray. There's not a tear shed. The Bible says that He doesn't see that I shed. Isn't that a wonderful blessing assurance today? So, we're talking about the source of this Jesus and, and we'll realize the counterfeits. When we get a hold of that true joy and the Holy Spirit begins to lead us and He's really Lord of our lives, Jesus Christ, then we'll find out that those things that used to bring us joy won't bring us joy anymore. The, the kids are learning about today those things that we used to laugh at we won't laugh at. <laughs> you know, I used to laugh at things that are now I find repulsive and disgusting. I used to, to, to just think that was so funny. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. Deep down, that deposit inside of me knew something was different. And I would laugh at other people's expense. The world has a definition for joy. Miller says it's living the high life. Those counterfeits begin to seep into our lives and we begin to make fun of people. We begin to have our joy at someone else's expense. So the joy that hell will bring you will always be in somebody else's. But the joy Jesus will bring you will always be at someone else's benefit. Isn't that a wonderful way to put it? The joy that hell's going to bring you is always going to be at somebody else's expense. It's going to cost somebody else something. Those things, think about it. Any sin you can think of. Millers live in the high life. How many broken homes are there because of the high life? Huh? I'm just on a drink when it's casual. That's between you and the Lord. If I wasn't going to drink something, well, I'm just going to meddle with it and I guess it's sleep deprivation. <laughs> I wasn't going to drink something that's poisoned so many homes and things. And I've been who you are if that's what you're doing. I've been there. I told the Lord that Jesus turned the water into wine. They already had water, so they wasn't thirsty. But eventually God said to me, you don't really need that, do you? I said, I don't know what you tell me if I need it or not. You don't need it. It'll be confusing to those you're trying to help would you lay it down for me? You absolutely will. And so all I'm asking you to do is talk to him about it. Talk to him about it. Because those things that you say, well, if I can get this, I'll find joy. If I can find this, I can find joy. Now, don't make no mistake. A good, strong cup of coffee brings me happiness. You know? And you can judge me all day long if you want to. And I buy it at Starbucks, so just pray for me. So, but if Lord told me to lay it down tomorrow, I'll lay it down. But that doesn't bring me joy. That doesn't bring me joy. Chocolate ice cream brought me happiness, but it doesn't bring me joy. 
There's a difference, isn't it? So the joy from heaven, the joy that I get from heaven, is not only going to benefit me, it's going to benefit somebody else. And that's, that's our next point. So let's look at overflow. How it overflows in us, this joy. The Apostle Paul says that when I get this joy, it's going to overflow with a confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. As I let the Holy Spirit live in my life and He begins to control my life and move forward, my hope in Christ has a hope inside of me. And hope does not disappoint. And hope is the beginning of trust. And so as I begin to trust, that's where it goes for. Hope at its core is faith. Hope at its core is faith. Look at this. I pray that the God, the source of all hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. So because I trust in Him, because I have hope in Him, I can receive hope from Him, the source of all hope. And hope is really faith. So as I begin to trust in God, trust is faith. Faith is hope. Hope brings joy, and joy brings peace. You'll hear me say that at least three more times before we finish today. I thought it was so powerful. Trust is faith. Faith is hope. Hope brings joy, and joy brings peace. See the progression? What a wonderful tool the Lord gave us here. Trust is faith. So I trust Him. I put my faith in Him. I build my faith up. Faith stirs my hope. Because that's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And hope brings joy. Because I have a joyfulness of knowing that this world is not my home. But even if I don't see an answer on this side of heaven, I will in heaven. And joy brings that sense of overwhelming peace that my name is written in the last book of life. So, spiritual joy and faith are intertwined with each other. And they produce feet, uh, peace. Sorry. So, Let's think about that for a second. We're talking about overflow. What brings rejoicing in heaven? What does the Bible say brings joy in heaven? There's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that comes home than over 99 righteous. So as I begin to get the joy of the Lord inside of me, that joy is going to stir up and begin to produce an ultimate overwhelming peace in me. And peace is so rare in the world that the world is going to look at me, and we'll get to that in our last emoji that we're going to look at, a peculiar people. But that peace is going to cause some interest. It's going to, want well, people are going to want to come to me and receive that because there's a, there's a sense of assurance about me or you. There's a sense of calmness that I have. And the devil doesn't want that because if he can't have you, he certainly don't want you to reach somebody else. And so he's going to try to steal your peace. We'll get more into that next week when we look at Amy. But that peace is going to draw people to you. And we're able to reach out and give people the source that we have, which is Jesus Christ. That rejoicing in heaven comes as those that accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so, as I begin to overflow, I overflow the joy. So how do I get that in my heart? How do I get that in my mind? Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not a gift. It's a fruit. And this is going to help a lot of you today. It certainly helped me when God gave it to me this week. Fruit of the Spirit is born out of my character. It's born out of my relationship with Jesus Christ. A gift that God gives me, I can have the gift of healing. I can have the gift of gab. I can have the gift of whatever He wants to give me. And give me that gift. That's something that I could not have come up with on my own. But the fruits of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians, joy, peace, love, kindness, gentleness, self-control, those types of gift, fruits are born out of my relationship with God. They are produced out of my life based on my life with Him. And so joy is going to come from within inside of me. Joy is going to come when I let Holy Spirit rule my life. Joy is going to come when I let Jesus into every part of my life. And that joy is going to be produced out of me. See, no one can steal that from you. Only someone can convince you not to do it. The source is there. The cure is there. You just have to draw on it. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel like you need to, that you can even do it or, or even need to do it because 
You just feel like hope deferred is happening over and over. You don't see that thing coming. The frustration there. The Bible even says that it makes the heart sick. But in my relationship with God, in the daily getting it out with Him and receiving that joy, it's going to turn into peace. And that is going to be produced overflowing into the world. Jesus said that I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. That's not just in heaven, that's here. And the Amplified says to the point of overflowing. I should overflow into those relationships that I have. Jesus overflowing in you, in me. So let's look at in you very quickly. If I say anything to you today that you hold on to, just remember this. Joy is a choice. It's not based on circumstances. It's not based on answer to prayer. Joy, the fruit of joy, is a choice. And that choice will be birthed in me. And I know that sounds crazy. It sounds foolish to the world. But it's a choice. Think about this. The Apostle Paul that we're reading here, the book of Romans, he wrote about joy 21 times. 21 different occasions through his letters and his writings in the New Testament in the Bible, not, not just other things that are not canonized, but in the Bible alone, wrote about joy 21 times. So what, what's so big about that? Well, the Apostle Paul, on the day of his conversion, Ananias said to him, the Apostle Paul, receive ye the Holy Spirit, and may you know how much you must suffer for the Lord. So on the day of receiving his salvation and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit into his life, he was told, basically prophesied over that day, that he would suffer great for the Lord. This is cross bear. Some may say, well, he got what he deserved. He persecuted Christians. No, that's not how this works. If you look at every disciple of Jesus Christ, they suffered great. I don't know where this pink Cadillac gold couch comes from, and I know I'm going to lot. The prosperity gospel won't preach all over the world, and therefore it is a false gospel. That's a good. Wow, it's good. Crickets are good. It's all right. Prosperity gospel is a false gospel. A gospel that is centered around you is a gospel of flesh, and it is the beginning of Antichrist coming into the world and coming into your life. Because you are not the God of your life. If you are, then you've heard and received the false gospel. I'm just working through how much little sleep I've had and if I, if I would have reserved that if I hadn't, but it's all good. That's just rock. Sound good? All right. So, as we began to realize what is in our heart and in our mind, we began to process those things and we began to look at what Paul went through at, at the suffering that he had. Joy is something he wrote about. Joy is something that he proclaimed to possess him that we talked about a couple weeks ago that began to sing praises and hymns after he'd been beaten with rods that night. He was beaten and stoned multiple times, shipwrecked, snake bitten, which we'll preach on in a few weeks, jailed, imprisoned, beaten, betrayed, and ultimately beheaded. But yet this man wrote about joy 21 times. Most of those times he wrote about joy was in prison. He got a hold of what James said. James said in his letter, and if those of you who were with me knew that we took about 16 weeks in the book of James in those five chapters, right before summer started. But James starts out, consider it all joy, brothers, when you face persecution, when you face strife, when you face suffering, because it's an opportunity for you. When you and I face stuff, when we, we deal with things and things come our way, it's an opportunity for joy. But we don't see the opportunity, do we? We just see what's in front of us. We see all the trouble. We see all the pain. That's a natural response. And I'm not here to beat you up about that natural response today. You're going to hear me bear my soul in a second. But what I am here to tell you today, that you know the source to get a hold of something that is not natural. Yeah. That is supernatural. Yeah. And so if you want joy back in your life, get over what you see and get a hold of those things in your life that you know Again, the analogy that he gave this 
morning to me. It's so powerful in my mind that the cure is there, but I'm refusing to get a hold of it. I'm so blind and I'm so sick that I think I can't even get out of bed. And if I would just rise to my feet and then get on my knees, I would get joy in my life and in my heart. We think I am joy for my The joy comes in your mind. And I said, the joy of the Lord be your strength. Let Sandal and me, Sandal and let Tamiah be Tamiah. You don't know who they are, be Nehemiah. You just build the wall and build it with joy. The joy of the Lord shall be my strength. We have the Paul, we have the Apostle Paul to give us that powerful look. And James to tell us that when we face trials, when we face troubles, when we face persecution, it's just an opportunity to receive that joy. God wants you to receive it today. How can that be? Trust is faith. Faith is hope. Hope brings joy and joy brings peace. That's how we do it. I made a decision this week. I look back at my text messages. I made a decision Wednesday morning that we would preach on joy this week. It worked out in the series because I was doing some traveling and some other things that we're kind of moving them around week by week. The Children's Church regularly stands on its own, so they were letting me pick based on the time I had to prepare and some other things. And so we had three left. I knew what I was going to end with. I knew that from the beginning. We're going to end with we're, we're peculiar people, people of God. And so there were only two left, joy and anger. And Teresa and I kind of picked at each other the week prior and said, well, we'll just wait and make a choice on how the surgery goes. But are you going to preach on joy? Or are you going to preach on me? And how appropriate I preach on joy today, amen? amen. But Wednesday morning, I didn't know that. Wednesday morning, I had just received word late Tuesday evening that surgery did not go as planned. And that she basically had to have two surgeries. One to open her up where they thought the mass was, only to find that it wasn't there. And then had to go to a much more invasive and deeper surgery. They would go through the pillows. And so basically she was cut as a cross. And that, what we thought was a very simple procedure that was going to have a long recovery turn into a very complicated procedure that would have a much longer recovery with a positive outlook of probably lifestyle is not going to change. And this mass is most likely not cancerous and we're able to get it all. But we won't know until the test results come in. You can realize how lack of hope I had in that statement based on how the surgery from me. But I made a choice Wednesday morning as I was praying to the Lord, working through, listening to her in pain most of the night. That I'm going to choose joy. Regardless of what comes to my name, I'm going to choose joy. And why do I want to choose joy? It's because I want to live beyond my emotions. I really do. I want to live beyond my emotions. Did I question God? Absolutely. Did I ask Him why He didn't go ahead and remove that mask? Did I not ask Him to do it? Absolutely. One time somebody told Teresa and I Hunter wasn't healed because he didn't have enough, I didn't have enough faith. I believe anything God tells me, and I'll hold on to it. If he tells me to run through that wall, you better get out of the way. But if he doesn't tell me, then I'll open my mind to whatever he wants to do. His will and not mine. And so as I began to go through all those things, questioning all those things, lamenting, even getting angry. Went through all those stages of grief we talked about last week. At the end of it, I said, No, I trust you. I trust you. And at the end of that, he told me, He said, Assignment canceled. I wasn't sure exactly what that meant as the week progressed. We began to hear that the report came back, but there was nothing in it. And as we hear today, she's released a head of schedule. The enemy's assignment was canceled. Amen. In the way that God wanted to do. And you know what? I believe part of it was for today. 
I had anybody and everybody who loved me this week say, you need to get somebody someday. And the more the week progressed, the more I said, I really did. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can be who I need to be for the people. This morning at about 4.30, I knew that I was on assignment today. And I knew that you needed to hear what I just did. And I'm no poster girl. Don't get me wrong. Tracy's been called the poster girl of recovery before she got released today. But I'm not a poster girl. I struggle with something. But what I want you to hear today is that after I get through that, I know the truth. That's right. And I know the truth because I stay with Jesus. Jesus reminds me of the truth over and over and over. And if you don't stay with Jesus, the truth becomes foreign to you. It becomes just a distant memory. It becomes like, I don't even realize. Why do we take pictures of major events that bring us joy? Because we want to relive those things. How can you accept salvation and then just have this casual top ten relationship with Jesus? You're not going to have this joy that I'm speaking of today doing that. You've got to let him be Lord of your life. Yeah. He must move in every part of your life. I want to live beyond my emotions. I'm not perfect. I fight doubt. I ask why. I ask why this week. But after I all got it out, after I got it all out, I decided to have joy. Joy brings peace. So trust brings faith. I trust that God brought my faith back in him. Faith brings hope. Hope brings joy and joy brings peace. And I can come in here today, put on a face, and tell you that we're rejoicing with joy because of what God's done. But what I really want you to see is my transparency and let you know that I chose joy before I ever had the news. Because she needed it. Hunter needed me too. You need me too. And I need you too. Your family needs you too. Those people that are around you, they need you to choose you. Regardless of the situation, just go ahead and choose it today. So as the praise team comes and I close today, I praise God that the mass was canceled, that that assignment was gone, that Jesus has chosen to save the life. If I begin to think about it, I won't be able to finish. I cannot tell you how thankful I am for you. But I'm telling you today that before all that happened, I had joy. I wasn't happy. I'm still not happy. I would have chosen a much different route. But I have joy. So today, I just want to ask you a few questions as they come back. Let's sing the last song that you guys sing. We've got to look through the eyes of Jesus today, church. He's got to be our source. So the first thing I want to know is do you have him in your heart? Do you have him there today? Is he your source? Secondly, is he first? Is he first in your life? Is he top ten? Is he top three? Is he number one? Do you have him as your go-to source? Do you have enough of him today to overflow into other people, into someone or something else that he's asking you to do for him? Are you ready to choose joy today? Regardless of what's going on, what you're going through or where you are, I pray that the God, the mighty God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you receive that today? The altars are open. If you want to pray, you want to come pray with me. I'm here. Let's pray and worship together.